lose any of this goodness here. And sure enough, we are live. We already have some people tuning in, which is so exciting. And Craig, I can't thank you enough for taking the time to come on here and, and talk a little bit about, we have so many special things going on here. And one of the things that you and I have been talking about was how, you know, obviously everybody is stuck at home. We wanna get better at our golf swing, but we can't make it to the range. We can't make it to the course, or at least a lot of us. And I think when you and I first met at the PGA show down in Orlando back in January, we had some really similar ideas for how players can improve the game. And one of the things that, that I did when I was developing the Mobilitas method was I wanted to kind of look at a holistic approach for how golfers can improve from the inside out by working on things like mindset and wellness, mobility, fitness, and performance, and, and helping people reshape their movement patterns. And I think what you do and what you teach and what you provide plays into that so perfectly. Because whether we're in front of a PGA professional like yourself, or I wore my shirt today too, or we're just working at home because that opportunity right now isn't there, we want to make sure that we're doing the right things, that we're moving the right way, that we're training our eye, we're training our body. And, and you have a lot of experience that you're going to be able to share with everybody, which I think is incredible. And for anybody watching right now, we are going to be doing a Q&A session here at the end. So if you have any questions at all, go ahead and type them into the comments section, tag your friends, whatever you need to. Uh, we'll get to all of those uh, towards the end here. And uh, if you know somebody that can't make the live stream or you have to head out early, I'm going to be reposting this recording later to my group, the Mobilitas Movers, and I'll post a link to that group as well. But go ahead and start submitting those questions. Now, Craig, what I want to talk about now is who you are and, and why you're here in the first place. And you have an amazing background. We see PGA logo right there on your shirt. But it's more than that. You have an experience doing something that a lot of golfers dream of doing. And that's kind of what spawned uh, this whole journey here. I'd love for you to take a minute and kind of tell us a little bit about who you are and, and what your journey has been like. Yeah, no, thanks a lot, Blaine. This is awesome. Uh, obviously, everybody's kind of locked up, hauled up, quarantined, isolated, whatever you want to call it right now. And um, you know, I'm, I'm in my office here at home, and this is a great opportunity for me to try to help people, try to motivate people and share as well. So thank you very much for having me on, on this live broadcast with you. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess the question is why, right? Everybody has to answer the why in their life when it comes to golf in particular. And for me, uh, I started out basically with a, a plastic club in my hand when I was a, a little baby. My, my parents are Scottish. My, my wee granny from Scotland said, uh, we're going to put a plastic club in, in Craig's hand as soon as, as soon as we can get one in his hand. And so for me, that passion was, you know, just keep playing. And, and I guess the better I did as a junior golfer, the, the more I wanted to compete and the more I wanted to play. And, and for me, my, my current reason why I'm passionate about the game is I love the competition part of it. You know, a lot of people maybe watching are, are interested in the socialization part of it. They want to get out with friends and family. Uh, they may want to just do it for exercise. Uh, the golf course canvases that we get to experience all around the world are amazing. And so when someone has an opportunity to maybe go to a special place like Banff in, in Canada and go and and look at the like crystal blue ocean or, or crystal blue lakes or go to Bermuda and look at the crystal blue ocean. Now those are two amazing canvases that I've been able to experience in my travels as a touring pro. Um, the reason why I go to those beautiful locations is to compete and try to challenge myself, try to get my game to the highest level. I remember when I was a high school kid and it really struck me that you know, this is what I want to do. I want to go play professionally. I wrote out some goals and I set them on my, my closet door. You know, the first one was become the number one player in the world, right? Um, you know, I, I put up pictures of Greg Norman. He, coming from Australia, he was, you know, a great role model and inspiration for me. And so as I progressed from, through my high school career, which by the way, um, growing up in Australia, I attended the Corralbin International School. 
Uh, Corralvin International School has uh, so many amazing athletes that graduated from there. A few you might know, uh, Adam Scott is one. Uh, Jason Day also attended there. Uh, Stephen Bowditch also went to school there and many others. Um, so I had an opportunity in that school to then really refine my game. Uh, I was a 15 handicap when I went there at a, at, as a 10th grader. And then when I graduated a couple years later, I was a plus two. So I had a tremendous drop in my, in my handicap, which is why it motivated me to then get a scholarship and come to the U.S. to uh, attend college because I felt like the United States is where all the best golfers were and that's where I wanted to be. And if I wanted to achieve that goal of being the number one player in the world, this is where I needed to be. So I've been here ever since. And uh, my opportunities have gone from teaching and coaching to playing, uh, inventing products, putters, training aids, et cetera. And so, you know, golf is what I do and, and helping people is what I do. And so uh, that's just, just a, a little glimpse into my journey, you know, to this point. Well, that's pretty amazing right there. And, I, you know, I'm learning something new as well. I didn't know that you came from Australia there. It's a, it's a beautiful country. And uh, it is full of some really amazing golf there. Um, and I want to touch a little bit on the whole travel aspect of things, because obviously that was the thing that started to spark uh, what we're going to talk about here in a little bit. And, you know, travel right now is a touchy subject because a lot of us can't do it. But the beautiful thing about what we're going to be talking about is, okay, your journey was inspired by travel and by play and by competition and by, you know, this striving to become your best. And those are all the core principles that we talk about in my community. And what I want to talk about is, well, what if you can't travel? What if you're stuck at home? It's the opposite of travel. You're only in your living room. You mentioned in a conversation we had before this how kind of what you're doing to create products and, and your teaching philosophies stemmed from the time that you spent in hotel rooms. Could you touch a little bit on that? Yeah, you know, it, it, it dawned on me as we're dealing with this that, um, you know, if I was going to continue to improve my own game, which I am, unfortunately, my, my national club pro championship, which is in April, was postponed. Uh, the PGA Championship in San Francisco has also been postponed. Um, at this moment in time, as I, as I came from, from Park City, Utah, where I'm the Director of Instruction at Glenwild, uh, I was actually coming to Arizona to prepare and to play some tournaments, get ready for the National Club Pro in April uh, that was supposed to be played at Barton Creek in Austin. And so, you know, when all of the, the coronavirus, uh, you know, rules and regulations started to come out as far as us having to isolate and, and spend time at home, um, it dawned on me that, you know, even though it's beautiful and sunny outside right now, the golf courses are starting to shut down and the opportunity for people to go and hit balls and play is starting to minimize. Now, there are still some that are open and you can still go and do that. And if you're lucky enough to be able to do that, that's great. Um, but, you know, for me personally, I started to think of, okay, how do I keep my game sharp? How do I continue to work on proper fundamentals? Um, a lot of times when we're playing, you know, practicing on the driving range, we have the golf ball as our feedback, right? We can look at ball flight. We can, you know, if we're hitting a slice or a hook or we're just not making solid contact, we have the opportunity to do some correction. And I think the problem with a lot of uh, golfers out there is they're constantly solving for their mistakes. You know, an old school golfer told me, you know, like army golf, you hit it left, right, left, right. Well, that's a great way to solve problems. But at the same time, if you actually just focused on sticking right down the middle and focused on proper fundamentals, and you actually wired your, your muscle firing patterns to have proper fundamentals, then you would actually be solving both right and left at the same time, right? So I felt, you know, in my journey as I traveled around the world playing tournaments, I, you know, I may be stuck in a hotel room for a reason. Uh, maybe the weather's bad. Uh, maybe uh, the, the environment that we're in, the city we're in was just having, you know, violence. 
um, that was not safe for us to go out. We, we maybe rode a bus, like for example, when I went to Santiago, Chile, I played a web.com tour event. That's a beautiful city and really not that dangerous. Um, but we had designated transport. So we pretty much all stayed in a hotel, uh, one or two hotels in, an, in the city area. And then we had to ride Greyhound buses out to the golf course. Well, if you missed that bus, you were on your own, right? So we would do our bus travel and we'd be, be back at the hotel. It would still be sunshine outside. And normally we'd be at the range practicing, working on short game, putting, et cetera. Uh, but we landed back in the hotel. And so what was fortunate for me is I went from a teaching pro of a 10, 12 year career as a teaching pro to a playing professional. So I did it maybe old school. I did it like a Sam Sneed might have done or you know, an old school professional that kind of grew up in the business, teaching, playing, doing club repair, selling shirts, you know, cleaning clubs, doing all that. And then as my game evolved and got better and better, I got to the point where I was a quality enough player to earn a tour card on the web.com tour tour. So even though I missed out on my PGA tour card, I still had a tour that was a world tour that I could travel on. And in that process, I had already developed a lot of the training tools and the methods that I was going to be using while on the road. So instead of being stuck in a hotel, I'm now at home and I'm still using all of my training products and the processes that I go through to help me improve. And that was really the, the, the root of it all was how do I continue to do fundamentally correct things to ingrain proper movement patterns, to keep my muscles strong, to keep them flexible, to just kind of keep my mind quiet as I'm going through proper patterns. Um, and then I was able to transfer that to the golf course more effectively. So, um, you know, that's just kind of where it all stemmed from, coming from a hotel room in travel to now the living room at, at home, the office at home. And so hopefully I get a chance to kind of share a few of these things with you. Yeah, no, that's such an incredible story. And one of the things that I think we all want to do is, is travel around the world, right? And especially if you're able to play golf and make a living with it, that's, that's just so amazing. And you touch on a couple of really important pieces here. You know, I was just on the phone with a couple of my clients I do remote training with this morning and courses are closing down in their area. And I think a lot of people watching this right now can relate to that. We're stuck at home. We can't get to the course. And you were able to kind of see through that and, and change your environment. And one of the things I'd like to talk about in my community is how you can make your environment productive or it can work against you just depending on your mindset and your goals. And you obviously have the goal of wanting to play better golf. And because you were locked onto that vision, you said, look, just because I'm not on green grass, just because I can't see the ball flight doesn't mean I can't work on the things that lead into playing better golf. So anybody watching, if you have any questions, if this relates to the situation you're in, go ahead and throw your questions in the comments section. We'll get to them and we'll make sure that you guys have everything that you need in your toolkit or in your bag to be able to work from home. Now, speaking of bag, you've, you've talked a little bit about how traveling, staying in your hotel room, necessity, it's teaching for over a decade. It led to the creation of some products that really help you in your game, but also your students as well, make sure that they know that they're working on the right things. And for anybody watching, we're going to have a very special offer here that Craig was really nice enough to extend at the end. So make sure you stick around for that. But speaking of bag, I see in the corner of my screen right here in your room, you have a bag here, Sabre Golf. What is Sabre Golf? Yeah, um, you know, the Sabre was, was a word that, that kept popping up in my mind uh, every time I gave a golf lesson. You know, a, a, lot, of, a lot of students would, would have way too much grip pressure. They would guide the club. They would always be directing it. You know, our minds go to direction and accuracy and we feel like why would we add power to something that's just going to go crooked right so a lot of people started toning down their swings they always felt like there was some i always felt as an instructor i was watching just this guided movement through there 
So I would often uh, take, you know, an alignment rod and I would wander off to the side of my driving range where there was some longer grass and some little, little bushes. And I would say, take this um, alignment rod and swish it through the air as fast as you can, like a saber, like a sword, and swish, 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 and knock the leaves off the trees or trim the weeds down. You know, if I said, Blaine, I need you to go out in the field and cut down all that corn or that wheat, and you just swish the stick back and forth, you were cutting, cutting, cutting using a sword. So the saber came to mind as a sword, right, for doing that. So that's where the name came from. And then this was the original product that I created. So it's a stick, right? You know, it's, it's a two-ended stick, and I'll explain a lot of the different features of this. But basically what it really came, you know, came out of this was reckless abandon, right, freedom. I wanted my students to move athletically and freely without, you know, locking up their swing and guiding it and directing it. So <clears throat> the very first saber that I created was round. And it had a, a light end and a heavy end, right? So if you grip this end, you know, you have a really light stick to swing back and forth. If you grip this end, you have a really heavy one for training because as a kid, learning from some of the Australian Institute of Sport Training and some of the high level training that we got, we learned the equation for power was strength plus speed, right? So if you're gonna be powerful, you have to have strength and speed. So a training aid that would create good power would have a strength element, a heavy end, and then a, a speed element, which is a light end. And you may also be able to hear that ball dropping back and forth. So the reason why this is a Sabre 2.0 is because the original Sabre didn't have a lot of these features. It was just round. And I loved it and I used it and I was able to increase my strength and my speed and ultimately my power. But then when I started having my students use the product, there was one key element that was missing and that was club face awareness, right? So if you take a, you know, for example, a great product out there, super speed, trainers with different weights and you go through the protocols, you can increase your speed, but what you're not able to increase is that club face awareness. So I said, okay, how do I solve that problem? I solved it by making it square, right? So if you can see the saber itself has sides to it. And so the sides of the saber, what they allow me to do is position grip properly, right? So if I were to take for example, I've got the light end of the saber. You can see right there, it says light snap, right, at this end. And then at the other end, you can see it says heavy swish. So you'll also notice that one side on this saber 2.0 is blue, and the other sides are all a carbon fiber, right? So <clears throat> when I started working with my students on this, it was very important for me to be able to teach them grip, proper grip placement. The square shape allows for that. And then as they were making their swings, if I, if I started my student in this position and then they kind of moved back to here, you can still see the blue stripe is on top. So as I hinged in an anatomical neutral kind of hinge position right here, that blue stripe is exactly on the underside. The downswing position, blue stripe is on top again right back through impact, blue stripe is on top, and then to follow through, you can still see that the blue stripe is there. And so as someone was working on their power, their strength and their speed, they were also able to work on the awareness of the club face. So what you're saying here is, even if we can't see the ball flight, we can train the proprioceptive awareness in our hand and our body of what our face is. Because yeah. Face is, I, I want to say, something like 80% correlated with ball flight direction. It's so important. And wherever you're pointing that face, I think it's even higher on putting. Um, but the point being that you don't have to see ball flight to be able to train that path. And it looks short enough uh, that you can swing it in the room. Do you have a little, a little bit of space there to show us maybe a couple strength and a couple switches? Yeah. So, for example, I'll run you through what the kids would do, right? So, sure. Um, the saber has different sizes, right? So this, the green one right here is 30 inches long, 
And then the, the blue one is 37 and a half, 38 inches long, right? So they all go from 30 up. There's a, there's a few different sizes. So for example, kids, if you've got parents watching or kids are watching and they want to kind of go through what the kids do, I'll show you. So on this particular saber, we have two what we'll call beginner sabers, a kid's saber and then the, the 1.0 red saber. Are written on here, I'll bring it in here real close. You can see the first one is grit, stance, bow, pop, drop, spin, set, snap, hold. So I'll run you through the routine that a kid would go through. And I've got plenty of room. I can swing the longest saber, but I'll do it reading the information that's on this saber. So for example, this is grip, right? Get your sabers up in the air, hold it straight, relax your shoulders, thumb on top, that's the hot dog, cover it up, that's the bun, right? So feet together, grip, stance. I'm just reading, bow, right? So a little bit of a bow. We're not doing a slouch, we're not doing a butt out position, we're just doing a little thoracic spine kind of bow, right, bow. Pop the knees. Drop the saber. I like to use the word spin as a coach because I want my students to spin and rotate their body. So spin to here. It allows that thumb to naturally hinge right underneath. Set. There's a little ball that just set into my hands. Snap and hold. All right, so I'll do it again. Grip, stance, bow, pop, drop. Spin, set, and hold. You heard the snap, I'm sure. Yeah, that very, was brilliant it, right there. Yeah, it's a very uh, strong, audible sound. Now, let's say, for example, <clears throat> you have an over-the-top slice, right? So you get to the top of your swing. You do this with a saber. The ball has just dropped into my hands. What you'll hear is the snap of the ball will change location. If I come over the top, if I've got too much lag, I'll, the snapping sound will happen all the way over here, all right? I'll do it again. All right, so it looked good. Everything looked good what I was doing here. Problem was, is as I started my swing, I lagged and I came over and the snap location was way in front. So what I do with my students that struggle with that is I have them do what's called a hammer down snap, right? So I'll take the saber, you go to the backswing, keep your body turned into the backswing position. Instead of rotating first and lagging, I have them just hammer down and work on a hammer down snap, right? Because usually what happens is the sequence is happening, but it's usually delayed from the arms. The hands and arms need to move way faster than any rotation of the body. And usually what happens when someone slices is they kick the hip forward because they're trying to use the ground, they're trying to create power, but then as they spin, their hands and arms are lagging way behind, and then the snap happens way too late, right? So if you snap earlier and allow the momentum of the club to continue, now, essentially what you've done is created an into-out swing path, right? So as I use, you know, the, the larger saber, so this is the 2.0 version. It's our best seller. It's, uh, you know, what most people use. I take the light end of the saber, go to the top of my swing, and snap it through right? <clears throat> the reason why I created the saber at this length is because when you swing the saber, you're not going to touch the ground with it, right? <laughs> Some people will send me pictures of little blue stripes on the carpet because <laughs> they'll hit the carpet and the blue, the blue grip will rub off. <clears throat> we want to have about three inches of space. So here's some math for you. If you take a 45 inch driver and then you take a 35 inch pitching wedge and you were to train the middle club of that range, you'd be training something at 40 inches. If you take a saber that's 
37 and a half inches long, and you keep it three inches off the ground, you're training something at around 40 inches. And the reason why I made it that length for at home training was because <clears throat> if I were to actually train my driver swing, I should raise the saber up a few more inches so that when I create my path, it's a little flatter and a little bit more round. If I were to train a pitching wedge, I would grip down and then bring the saber in closer to my feet so that my swing would actually work a little bit more upright so that I'd be able to work on all those things together. So <clears throat> there's many more features of this thing. One of the reasons why I created what I feel like is the ultimate training aid is because it actually does about what 10 other training aids on the market do. All right, so I have the ability to do strength, speed, timing, and the technique features, square grip for club face awareness, the blue stripe for a visual. On the side of it here are actually indicators for ball position. So when you do get a chance to go out to the driving range, you lay this at your feet as an alignment tool, and then you put your lead foot here, you take your ball, put it where it says ball. Then when you're gonna do a chip, you just move your right foot. So this is a Ben Hogan, Jack Nicklaus, single ball position method. Chip, pitch, iron, and wood. So you're moving your stance just with your right foot as it goes backwards. I'll bring this down and show you, All right? So if I set this on the ground here, and I was gonna work on say a seven iron, I take the ball, put it out there where it says ball, take my seven iron, put my left foot in the grip section, and if I was gonna chip with a seven iron, I would be right here. If I was gonna pitch or hit a full swing seven iron, I would be more right here. So I'm sure just explaining a few of those things maybe brought up some questions <laughs> for you. There's a lot of information packed in the tool. So you touch on a couple really important things here. And, and one of the things that I think a lot of players without doing anything can benefit from is just the idea of what you, you talked about. We don't want to train hitting so much as we want to train swinging through. And I think where a lot of people get in trouble is they're trying, you know, as, as much as we like to think we're, we're great, you know, no perfect person is perfect enough to be able to time everything incredibly perfectly. It's let's, let's build a swing. And if we're training a strike, it's different than let's train the pattern. If we can train this motion while having face awareness, the ball will get in the way. And the other thing that I think you touch on there that's so important is there's a lot of confusion about all right, well, with a chip shot, the ball goes in the middle, and with a seven iron, it goes in this position, with the driver goes here, and blah, 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 blah. But really, with a couple small exceptions, the ball is staying in the same place. You're changing your stance. And I think that's pretty incredible right there. And, and so everybody watching at home, I, I want you to start thinking about the things that you struggle with, and we can start to relate them to what's going on here with the Sabre. So go ahead and drop your questions if you have any questions. But if you're having trouble with a big slice, for example, probably number one thing that as professionals we see, you've already talked about the two key ingredients of a slice. Let's change our path, let's change our face. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that, that I'm a big believer of is, you know, anytime you hit a ball, it's kind of like pressing the save button, if you will, on that movement pattern. And so if we're on the range hitting ball after ball after ball after ball after ball, every shot we get that feedback of what the ball is doing. And it's like we keep pressing save, keep pressing save, keep pressing save, as opposed to let's go through the whole document and make those edits and make those changes. And then let's press save. So let's go through, all right, we're slicing the ball. We know we need to change our path. We need to change our face. Let's swing a saber a few hundred times, which really isn't that much to do a few hundred, especially if you spread it out a little bit. But now, by the time the ball is reintroduced into the equation, your path is noticeably different. Your face is much more aware. And then we actually get a change in that result. And this is why 
And part of what I'll do in my programming, especially on the drill side, is there's kind of two levels of drill, which is without ball and with ball. And it's let's go without ball to retrain the movement pattern. Then let's do drills and application and playing with a ball to actually put it into practice. And so what you're doing here lays that foundation from the golf performance side of let's take the ball out of the equation, let's learn the right patterns, let's make sure we ingrain it the right way, let's get the feel, let's build the strength, the speed, the kinematic sequence, how to use ground force, foot position, let's get the audible reaction, then go use it, go play with it. And mm -hmm. it sounds like as well, regardless of if a person watching here is working uh, with an instructor in person, they're working online, they're self-taught, you know, this kind of handles it all. They come and see Craig and Craig, you give them a prescription of what to do. It sounds like you basically tackle everything of there's something that you can do that, that we can work on here. And, and so that being said, uh, we're starting to have a couple of questions come in. So we'll kind of spread them out over the next few minutes. But one of them that I want to tackle right now, because we're kind of touching on it. This question comes from David Bruce Anthony. David, I don't know if you're watching, but I'll tag you if you're not, and we'll make sure that you get this answer here. And David, I believe, based on our conversations, and don't please don't get upset if I'm wrong on this, but I believe you live out in Turkey and don't have access to a driving range. And the thing that you're working on um, is a little bit difficult if you don't have a range unless you have a way to practice it and and what you've asked about is extension of the club through impact uh, it sounds like you're dealing with kind of pulling up a little bit maybe inconsistent ball striking and so Craig I'll turn it over to you is the saber a tool and what kind of drills would you prescribe to help somebody extend through impact to get that full release and improve the consistency of their ball striking yeah, no, that's that's obviously a very, very common problem. People you know, might refer to that as a chicken wing of some kind. Um, you know, what you said about hitting that save button is exactly right. Um, practice doesn't make perfect, it makes permanent, right? And so if you're practicing something incorrectly, you're just gonna solidify that incorrect move. And so um, if someone were to use a saber or have their own coach, that's awesome. Uh, coaches all around the world have my saber and basically they use this product as a communication tool right so it really streamlines the vocabulary um, if someone's struggling for example this problem of, of pulling in and not being able to extend I'll explain using the saber how I would fix that um, it goes back to a little bit about what we were talking about the single ball position versus a, a, a moving ball position and really you, you know we can play golf many, many different ways. You can move the ball or you can leave it where it is. A single ball position basically says that's the bottom of the arc, right? So if the turf is right here and the bottom of the arc is in the same place every single time, which in athletic movement for, for a right-handed golfer, the pivot of the left hip and the rotation of the shoulders basically all kind of happens in this alignment right here which is just inside the left heel. So as a starting point, it's very, very simple to keep the ball in the same position with every club. Just kind of work through your stance with in order to find that. You know, so as real a, quick, just, yeah. just to clarify here, you're just so everybody watching is, is uh, on the same page here. What you're saying is so long as there's a consistency from swing to swing, club to club, your strike point will be the same every time. You don't need to move the ball. But if you have a different wedge swing and a different driver swing and a different iron swing, then you've added more variables to the equation. But as right. long as you can simplify the swing and take a couple of variables out, and we both know that if you can control variables in the game of golf, that's a huge advantage. So yeah. same, well, call the same swing, same type of setup using the foot width, then the strike point is the same and you don't need to mess around with ball position. Yeah, exactly. And, and you know, and, and you know, some of the things that I do simply with the Sabre, and I'm gonna to get to answering that question as part of this. Um, but basically, if I'm working on my normal warm up routine with the Sabre, I'm gonna take it, I'm gonna use it, stretch it behind my shoulders, kind of work it back and forth. And then like you said, swinging it 100 times is a really easy thing to do every, time, every day. If I take my setup like this, 
and I just do some rotations back and forth. And I keep my head still and my feet still, even on the screen, using something in the background as a reference, you can see how consistently that movement is happening, right? You can see it stays on plane. You can see that one end of the saber reaches maybe the pillow in the background and back to the pillow or something like that, right? So what we're dealing with here is consistency of input gives us a consistency of outcome, right? So I've done several swings using the saber across my shoulders. What I've done is I've kind of activated the motor, the pivot in the middle, right? Then if I activate my arm swing, I'm gonna take the heavy end of the saber. So if I do the same thing and I just go back and forth, you can kind of see the path that that takes. I'm not really trying to create it. I'm just swishing, that's the heavy swish end of the saber. So if I go back and forth like this, keeping my head relatively still, my feet still, again, that's a consistent pattern that I'm building. If I wanted to speed that up, I flip the saber over to the light end and increase the speed. If I want to understand timing, I let the ball drop and accelerate. So to answer the question, <coughs> the elongation, right, the centrifugal force that's not just being created with the club itself. If I chop my arm off and this one arm weighed 10 pounds, this arm weighed 10 pounds and this weighs two pounds, now I've got 22 pounds of mass <clears throat> rotating and in motion around my body being balanced by the weight of my body as it goes around. So what's happening with the golfer and the question is as you're going through impact, you're not allowing your arms to extend. You're not allowing that to happen. Now, maybe the golf ball is too close to you in your setup, right? If the ball is too close, my hand-eye coordination isn't going to allow me to completely miss the ball. So if it's too close to me, I'm going to tuck my elbow in to reduce the length and to counteract the centrifugal force. So while you're swinging, if you're able to swing at home using a club or a saber, maybe get a, uh, a doormat, something that you can hit. <clears throat> and as you allow your arms to elongate and relax, they're going to extend out and you're going to develop that pattern of allowing centrifugal force to kind of happen. I call it a letdown or a pull, right? The force pulls my arms into extension. So that's one part of it is set up distance. The other part of it is where you're creating that extension. There's a really good chance that it, maybe at that moment of impact, that golfer is like this, but after impact, eventually their arms accelerate. So the timing of where they throw that energy is probably happening way too late. So for that golfer, I would say, throw the energy more back here, downward, and around, right, on plane but earlier, so that the arms are already extended and they go all the way through extended, right? Picture like a crane and a wrecking ball. That wrecking ball is swinging back and forth and that wrecking ball is gonna dump out and hit the ground way early. Then the crane, last second, might hinge upward. So the arms can hinge upward the spine's going to extend backwards to just to create space. So I would, I would just, I mean, there's many reasons, but I would throw those things out there just as ball position and arm extension and allowing that to happen with a club or a saber versus trying to do it with a golf ball. Anyway, sounds like you may not have access, uh, but that would be a great way to do that. I love that. And, um, what you're just talking about sparked an idea I want to share as well. If you do have access to balls, uh, this is what I used to do all the time with students in person. Um, this, by the way, if anybody's interested, this is my, one of my first irons. Uh, this is a four iron from my first set, an old Spalding muscle back blade, which explains my incessant need to play blades, even though I'm not good enough for them. But <laughs> ramble aside, 
uh, for anybody watching, one of the things that I used to love to do, because you, you make the point here, and we've touched on how, you know, we have this urge to strike and our, our low point might not be consistent and so forth, is I used to take players and have them stand with their feet together, move that keyboard there, and, and basically just have them do this for like 50, 60, 70, 80, 100 times, trying to hit the same spot every time. And then when they got comfortable, I just have them close their eyes, keep doing it, keep hitting that same point. And then if you have a trusting friend or a coach, what I'd start doing is just put a ball in the way. Just have a bucket, put a ball, put a ball, put a ball, put a ball. Because I think one of the things that people need to overcome is, you know, we as humans, we see round ball, flat club. How do we square them up? How do we hit? How do we strike as opposed to, let me just swing because what our body does, the swing we make, the face awareness that we have, that is the hit, that is the strike. And that's what I love so much about what you're talking about is you have a way to get people to make the right swing without having to actually impact anything. Now we had another question come in and I see some more tools in that bag. I'd be curious to know um, short game. Mm -hmm. Right, that's something that we can all improve. My God, sign me up for the tour if I could make a putt to save my life. <laughs> but tell me a little bit about some Saber short game uh, yeah. tools or training aids that you have that, and, and why that's such a powerful thing to be talking about. Yeah, I mean, this is, this is the Saber putting ruler, right? So, I mean, I used to go down to Home Depot and, and just buy a ruler, 36 inch ruler that was aluminum. Uh, very thin material, and, you know, a bit, it would sit in the bag, and I would pull it out, but then it would warp, and it would bend, and then I'd try to straighten it, but I could never get it exactly straight again, um, and the reason why I used the ruler is because, and the reason why I created my own ruler was, this is not flimsy, this is a little bit more sturdy, it's still aluminum, very lightweight material, um, but it's 36 inches long, and an inch and a quarter wide, so, if a player is to practice putting and they just simply put a ball and I'll, I'll hit a couple putts, I'll drop this down so you can see it. So if I take a, a, a ruler, a putting ruler, my putter, which just so happens to be a saber putter, <laughs> right? Um, and I practice my putting, I just set the ball on the end of the ruler and practice. Now this is something I did on tour for hours and hours and hours, right? You notice that one went off to the left of the ruler, okay? Well, if I can keep a ball on this ruler all the way to the other end, what that's going to allow me to do is at about uh, six feet, I can make all of my six footers if I can keep a ball rolling down this ruler, right? So, as I, as I used the ruler, I was able to work on it consistently to work on confidence, right? Because what happens is a player, you know, that goes and works on their, on their putting game, they can stand a certain way, you know, they can have an open stance, they can take a closed stance, they can have high hands, they can have low hands. Now, I would prescribe a certain pattern that was really going to help somebody with their stroke. If, if I had somebody working on their stroke and we looked at it from this perspective, I would want that putter shaft straight up and down. I basically want it aligned with their forearms. So this particular putter, I'm five foot six. This putter is 32 inches long, okay? And it has a 74 degree lie angle. So it's a little more upright and a little shorter. It basically allows the putter to swing. So if the putter is swinging back and forth, that's probably the simplest motion that any golfer could make to be consistent, right? So my goal as a player is to get out of the way of a swinging putter. Now, if I have to stand open, because for whatever reason, my arms swing a little in to out, then that's what I do. And what the ruler is gonna do is gonna reveal how should I stand. So what a lot of people do when they first get the ruler is they fight the ruler. They hate the ruler because the ruler 
reveals their stroke flaw. But <clears throat> through repetition, and I, I feel like when Ben Hogan said he dug it out of the dirt, he wasn't digging it out of the dirt, like literally. He was fatiguing himself. He was creating um, a, an efficiency of movement and an efficiency of practice because he did it so much repetitively. What he found while practicing was something efficient and simple that he could repeat, right? And so what you'll find by using the ruler is if you allow your arms to swing back and forth, and every time you take a square stance, you cut it off the side of the ruler, well, don't change the mechanics of your arm swing to get it to go down the ruler. Simply adjust the platform so that the swinging arms now go down the ruler, right? So putting is the absolute simplest thing we can do in golf. We're basically taking, you know, a round ball and a flat stick, and all we're doing is getting those two to collide. Right now, that movement right there is what usually causes all of us to miss putts. Right, that movement is tied to the other end, which is our hands, which is tied to our mind. When we go from our mind into a mechanism of I'm going to control this end, then we've got problems. If our mind is quiet and just like I'm holding it in my fingers, if I can get that to swing back and forth and simply collide with the ball with very little attention to what I'm trying to control or manipulate at that end, I'm gonna allow the putter to swing cleanly back and forth. And I'm gonna find that this is a much more repetitive motion than what I'm trying to do at this end with my shoulders or locking my elbows or gripping tight or twisting my hands a certain way. Again, try to get out of the way of a swinging putter that's what's gonna help produce. So if you go back to what's fundamental with putting, it's simple. All I'm trying to do is move that putter back and forth. If I can relax my mind, relax my body, create a repetitive motion back and forth, and then use something like a ruler, the same or putting ruler as direct feedback, then I know how to make these simple adjustments, right? So, <clears throat> Like all of my products, they're very multi-purpose. So what I did is I cut a channel. You can see the color change, right? So there's actually a channel cut into the saber, into the saber putting ruler, right? Now, when you do get a chance to go out to the putting green, if you're trying to read greens and you're trying to figure out how much break to play, well, basically on the saber putting ruler, you have a ramp for your ball, right? So as you use this, just like other training tools on the market, you roll balls down the ruler and you can learn how to read break. Once you've read that this putt breaks four feet right to left, you flip the ruler over and now you practice putting down the ruler onto a breaking putt. The stint meter, by the way, has a notch in it and that was designed very simply so that a uh, superintendent could take a, basically a ruler out onto the putting green, raise it to a specified angle that it dropped out of the notch. Well, that angle is 20 degrees. So now what we have is we have a smartphone that has a measuring tool on it, right? So on my smartphone, I can go to the measure app right here. And I can find a 20 degree angle. Once I've found the 20 degree angle, I can release balls down the ruler and then I can measure at 36 inch or three foot increments to determine what the stint meter is. Now I can check the stint meter reading the speed of the carpet in my office, right? So that's pretty easy to do. And there's ways to do that. You can watch lots of videos on that. But basically taking a saber putting ruler tilting it to 20 degrees and rolling balls down it, going one direction and then back, you can calculate the speed of the green. So when you're working on your stroke, there's so many different ways to get feedback and to use a product like this. And when I was traveling and competing, that's what I did in the hotel room. 
thousands of putts. And then what would happen is when I got to the course, I would actually visualize a blue track going wherever I was trying to point it. So the optics of it allowed me to then putt down a track to my target. And I absolutely, I mean, my God, have you unlocked something brilliant here by figuring out the line, the ideal speed, and then practicing it. Because I think one of the things, just by understanding, for those of you watching, if you want the best putting lesson I could ever give you, right here, right now, it can be summed up in one sentence. Every putt is a straight putt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right? And what we're saying here is you, the putter, shouldn't ever change the way that you putt. You should just change how much break you allow and at what speed you hit it. But you're always hitting them straight every single time. So with this tool, it sounds like, okay, let's use the track and say, okay, based on the ideal speed, which is the mathematicians say if the ball doesn't go in, it's about 17 inches past the hole. But you find that ideal speed and then you say, okay, this particular putt, it's a 10-foot putt, and I need to aim it 12 inches to the right of the hole. You don't create that 12 inches of break. You hit a perfectly straight putt 12 inches to the right of the hole. The gravity of the green makes it break. And so what you can do is not only train your stroke, but train your speed and train your awareness, especially if you're somebody who uses something like an aim point method of how far do I need to, okay, that's a, not, that's a two or whatever your method is, then actually train it, hit it down the ruler and at the right speed and you're gonna make them every time. I mean, that's brilliant right there. So that's, that's amazing. Now to shift gears a little bit, we had another question just come in. Um, on the other side of short game, this one comes from Todd Lipper out in Dallas, Texas. He, his biggest area, he could, he could be a scratch golfer if he could just own 100 yards and in. Okay. Well, what you're dealing with is what I like to call wedge calibration, right? So when a, just like you mentioned in putting, you're going to take your putter and you're going to move it in the direction of the, of the stroke that you've kind of felt as the, the simplest way to move it. Then you're going to move it at a desired speed to then collide with the ball so that the ball goes a predetermined distance, right? So there's been a lot of discussion on how to manage that, whether you use kind of like a clock system, whether you try to use different lengths of swing. Ultimately, what you're doing is trying to repeat movement at a certain rate of speed, right? So if I were to take, you know, the saber out again and swing it like a wedge, I'm going to figure out, okay, if I, what I feel like is, is the best way to understand speed is to understand it in jogging, walking, or running or sprinting, right? So there's four different speeds that we do, just like a heart rate. If I took off in a flat sprint, that's like 100% exertion, okay? If I'm walking, you know, Blaine, what, if you just went for a, a stroll, what kind of rate of speed would a walk be for you? I walk about 2.8 to 3.2 miles an hour. Okay, so <laughs> as, a, as a level of exertion, what yes. percent? percentage of exertion would a walk be for you? I'd say a casual walk is around a two, a nice scenic hike carrying a pack is a six, and then there's every level in between, just depending on how fast I'm going and what I'm carrying. Right, so a 20% exertion at a walk, 60% exertion if you're doing a hike. Um, if you were trying to jog and you were trying to actually get some blood flow, you might be tipping 80%. Yep. Um, you know, if you were to sprint, if it was a race of some kind and you had to beat someone to the finish line, you know, you might start out at 100 and then kind of drop to 80. If you're a cross-country runner, you might start at 60, build a 70, and then save a little bit in the gas tank for the final sprint to get across the finish line, right? So what we, the reason why I bring it up in terms of, of walking, jogging, running, and sprinting is because I feel like when I work on my own wedge calibration, I'm working on my wedges more at a percentage of energy exertion rather than a distance, right? So <clears throat> we may be familiar with a clock concept <clears throat> where if I'm setting up at my golf ball here and 
I'm going back to a three o'clock position. This is 12 o'clock and I go about one, two, three, four, five, six, right? Or if I flip the clock over and you're familiar with it that way, and this is 12 o'clock <coughs> or six o'clock here and it's seven, eight, nine going in that direction. However you decide to figure out the length of the swing, the reason why I'm not a huge fan of that is because I can take the club back to let's say a halfway position or a three o'clock position. And as I go back here, I could exert at 100% energy and I could hit that ball 100% distance, right? So what I want you know, the, 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 the viewer to understand is there's a collision that takes place between this end and the golf ball. And the club head and the golf ball, if I grab a wedge, right, especially a, a wedge, this is my 52 degree wedge. The problem with this collision concept is that if we're inconsistent with shaft lean, if we've got our hands forward or equal, neutral or backwards, we're changing the loft and therefore we're changing the collision. Right, so there's two things we want to remain constant. One is the club face, the position that we strike. And if you listen to a Bob Bokey or a Roger Cleveland, they're gonna say that really good groove interaction comes from a little bit of a flatter face than one that's sitting back. The ball tends to roll up the face and we get inconsistent roll. If it's here, we have better groove interaction and we can control that. So let's figure out how to have a constant setup. So if your hands are slightly ahead, I would watch players like Steve Stricker, Zach Johnson, players that have a slightly hands ahead at address position. So that's one constant that we need to have. The second constant or the, or the uh, I guess the variable that we need to be consistent at is the rate of speed. So as you make, as I make a swing, if I go back and forth, and I'm just making a short swing like this, I feel like this is like a five or 10% energy. <clears throat> if I were to increase that to 50% energy, my swing may have a, a different length than yours. My swing might get to belt high. My swing might get to shoulder high. I might have a little bit of wrist hinge. I might not have any wrist hinge at all, right? So, for me, the player, if I input into my mind, what's 50% energy, and then I try to strike it at the same location every time, I can then write down in my book that a 50% energy, 52 degree wedge goes 70 yards, right? If I have a 60% energy or a 75% energy or 100% energy, then I can figure out what those distances are. So I like to think about it that way because um, especially if someone's tuning into you, they're, they're interested in keeping themselves healthy and fit, they might have a better appreciation for speed or rate of exertion, right? I know that when I try to hit a really hard tee shot <clears throat> and I put 100% energy in, I'm kind of out of breath, to be honest, even one swing, right? I put it all into it. Problem with that is, you can't sustain that. So hopefully yeah, that helps. Absolutely. absolutely. And I think, I think you bring up a really great point here that golfers who uh, may have either trained the wrong way growing up or maybe they're just getting into the game and something that maybe you and I take for granted because we've been playing our whole life. You know, one of the examples I like to use with my clients is how the golf swing is a fluid motion where if we use an analogy, most golfers, because of the way they train, the way that they live, their ability to swing a club is like turning a light switch on or off. They have their full power or they don't. And in the case of maybe somebody like Todd, who is struggling from 100 and in, but is brilliant with his full swing, when his without getting technical, when his nervous system is full firing, he's great, but when we need to turn the level down, not so much. So the idea behind the training side is we want to turn that light switch into a dimmer switch where we can turn to full brightness, we can turn it down, we can be anywhere in between. And once we are able to control our body and, and have those many different levels, 
then we apply it into what you're talking about. Of like, here's 40%, here's 50%, here's 60%. Whereas to begin, and maybe this is a solution for Todd, is, is maybe just understand that for right now, you only have three gears. You can go 20%, 75 or 100. And in that case, you may need to take other approaches such as changing which club you use. Uh, just by changing the loft of the club, you have a couple more variables you can play with. Obviously, there's launch angles and spin rates, and we won't get into all that. But just note, short term, take what we're talking about here, groove whatever steps you have, and then over time, that 20%, 75%, 100% turns into 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, right? And one of the things that, that we see like a lot of tour players do, especially if they have access to launch monitors like a track man, is they'll take one club and they'll try to increase the distance they hit it by one or two yards of carry distance. Mm -hmm. Can I take a seven iron and hit it 100, then 105, then 110? Johnny Miller, you probably know this story. Johnny Miller famously, when he practiced, used to hit every single club in his bag to the 100 yard target, including his putter. And to do that with a wedge, okay, that's your normal swing. But to do 100 yards of carry with like a five iron is a totally different swing. So I love what you're talking about here. And I think once you begin to understand your speed and your consistency, that in turn also helps you understand the face awareness and, and the angles. Because if you're swinging the same rate of perceived exertion every time, but some go high, some go low, some go thin, some go, obviously there's something on with the mechanics, in which case, let's go back to the saber, square grip, face awareness, let's get our positions right, let's get that path moving, let's groove it without the ball, let's own it, and then let's reintroduce the ball, and they're gonna start to kind of play off each other, which, which I think is so great. Now, one of the things that we talked about early on, and we still have some people tuning in, we're gonna have people watching the free plays, but I wanna make sure that everybody gets this little reward. You've been incredibly generous uh, and came up with a couple of, of promotions here to help everybody get these tools so that they can continue to work on their game, not just during this coronavirus when we're on house arrest, but if we're a teaching professional and we want something for a studio or if we're at home and we want a training aid that we can work for the rest of our life because they're such quality products. And you've been gracious enough to offer anybody watching 20% off any of your products on your website, uh, sabergolf.com if I'm not mistaken. Um, they use the code Mobilitas, and I'll, I'll post that everywhere, Mobilitas, 20% off, and there's more. <laughs> right before we started this call, you came up with one more amazing offer for everybody watching. I want you to share that one with everybody. Yeah, so, so if you're watching, you may be thinking, okay, I need to go down the line. I need to stop worrying about over the top or underneath or shallow or steep or wrist hinge, do I bow, do I cup, you know, any of that stuff. You wanna go fundamentally down the line. I created a, a 10 video series on the 10 positions of the golf swing. And those can be applied whether you use a golf club or a saber. I use a saber in the video because it's one of my training um, videos for people who purchase the saber. So when somebody buys a saber, they get access to 32 videos that unlock ways to help you with its timing or the swing path. But I felt like if I'm kind of preaching fundamental awareness and just straight down the line mechanics, I needed to explain what those were. So I used the 10 positions of the golf swing and used the saber to talk through those. So anybody who's watching, send me an email. The email is info at sabersportstrainer.com. So if you shoot me an email, info at sabersportstrainer.com, I'm gonna give you free access to the 10 positions of the golf swing video. So whether you have a saber or not, you're gonna understand what, what are those 10 positions? How is it that I'm supposed to recognize those 10 positions? How do I do that? And ultimately what those videos are gonna do is show you how to not be position oriented, but to actually free up that athletic motion. So um, that's just something else I wanted to add in there. When someone purchases a Sabre uh, swing trainer product, they get those videos. 
uh, again, that 20% off is to help all of your viewers, you know, that are stuck at home, that are looking to train. Um, that code, the Mobilitas code works um, on any of the training aids. So whether you like the, the Sabre Swing Trainer or the Putting Ruler or these cool uh, little miniature putting discs, if you practice with this, it is so frustrating. Um, you, you put up over this little rubber rim and try to get the ball to stop inside the cup um, that is actually only three inches in diameter instead of four and a quarter. You do this, you know, all locked down, and then you're going to come out on the putting green and you're going to feel like you can make anything, right? So there's just some simple things, but again, you know, the products that I'm most passionate about are the ones that I've invented, like this, the sabers and the rulers and the, the putters, etc. So if someone goes to that sabergolf.com website, they're going to be able to look at all of that. Um, also on my YouTube channel is, is Craig Hocknell Golf. You can go watch Craig Hocknell Golf, you know, for hours and hours. There's over 300 videos on there of anything that you could possibly think of from how to stop getting blisters on your fingers to how to play a scramble uh, to understanding ground reaction force. So there's a lot of different videos on there as well. So I really appreciate your time and having me on here. Hopefully we can add some entertainment and some education to the viewers and, and they figure out a way to get better with their golf games while they're indoors instead of outdoors. I love it. And thank you so much, Craig. It's very generous of you with your time and with your offers here. Again, everybody, that's Mobilitas for 20% off any of the products. And email Craig at info at sabergolfsportstrainer.com to unlock those videos. Um, if people want to reach out to you, you just told us about your, your YouTube. If they want to email you or anything, is it that same info at? Yeah, so, info at Saber Sports Trainer. There's no golf in there. Oh, I wrote it down. Um, we have other products like baseball and lacrosse. So Saber Sports Trainer, um, Saber Golf is the golf website, and yeah. um, and then obviously they can follow me on Instagram as well or reach out on Facebook. Um, if you just search Craig Hocknell Saber Golf on Instagram, you can find my page. It's got some cool stuff on there as well. So thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Craig, and thank you to everybody watching. I'll go ahead and get the replay posted. Uh, and the moral of all this is just because you're stuck in at home doesn't mean that you can't work on your game. So we have many ways to do it right now. So as always, move better, play better, and let's go play some golf. Craig, thank you so much for being here. Cheers. All right, beautiful. Craig, that was awesome. Um, what I'll do now is, like I said, it's going to take a little bit of time for this all to process uh, so that we can uh, send you the recording of it.